Yo, what is up, guys? It has been way too long, man, but I am back at it, back to start cranking out more content. I've been stewing around, man, thinking of different things to talk about, and my channel is all over the place. I don't even like to call this a blog or a vlog, even though it, it basically is. We're not putting a name to it yet, because I just want this YouTube channel to archive subjects that I care about and that's not always in the most marketing friendly format, but I don't care. I make a living otherwise and don't need to depend on following the algorithms and all of the ways in which I can maximize what I do in a very narrow way. With that being said, today we're gonna to talk about something I saw on Instagram. I'm gonna summarize it for you real quick. Basically, I believe it was The Corner reposted a tweet from OB on Beat Music most commonly known being affiliated with Rapzilla, but also being a solo super producer slash music critiquer slash curator. Good homie of mine, love the guy to death. Um, he had made a post essentially talking about how a lot of people take advantage of producers by basically coming at them to work with them either through a feature or collaboration or yo, I wanna buy a beat from you and essentially have what I call hot dog wallet, which is where they ain't got no money at all um, and the little money they have to speak of, they're not even interested in offering that um, in any kind of serious context for purchasing beats and he was discouraged by that. And I know producers get really frustrated with this. Artists do too, you have situations where Beat makers aren't taken seriously. They're constantly getting lowballed and bargained with. You have artists who are getting the same when it comes to features, collaborations. The business looks different at varying levels. And even within those levels, there's always wiggle room of negotiation. There's a lot of assumed things culturally in the kind of culture of business in general when it comes to music. But then there's an added layer of it in the Christian community because for some reason we have a hard time navigating a healthy discernment of what good business and good etiquette looks like as we transact, as we purchase things, as we inquire about things, as we collaborate. There's really no rules and there should be. And I don't mean there should be assumed and implied rules because it's clear that they don't exist. Many people have different agendas and understandings of what good business is. But here's the number one reality I want you guys to swallow for a second. And if you're an artist, if you're any type of person who runs your own business or makes money through a side hustle or hobby, this video's for you. You're really gonna understand this, but I think even deeper if you zoom out, this video really comes down to what does healthy business communication look like? How do I be considerate? How can I do this to glorify God? And what does that practically look like? And what things should I be considering? What things am I not considering? It, I'm throwing some vibes your way about all the things that go through my head in this subject because I've learned a lot over the years and hopefully you can pick up some gems and learn some things you hadn't before. And even debate with me if you disagree. Now, I've been doing online transactions in the form of providing services and products for people for probably 20 years. I can remember as early as being 13 and going to um, Best Buy and copping vinyl, uh, vinyl looking burn CDs. And whenever I would come out with an album when I first started making music, I would burn CDs and take them to school and say, hey, this is my album with my stepbrother at the time. And we would hustle CDs and make transactions. Now back then it was with cash, but eventually it moved into online orders, online merch, digital sales of documents and audio. Um, selling and producing merchandise, posters, artwork, all of that stuff. And the transactions moved online. And as social media grew, those businesses or streams of income and different ventures that we had all uh, evolved into the online transaction process where uh, outside of my normal nine to five where I'm getting a W-2 or whatever, uh, or W-9, um, 
all of the transactions of my side businesses come strictly through Cash App and PayPal. Um, and so that means that the negotiations even are mostly online and the business transactions verbally take place online more than in person outside of my day nine to five. Um, my night nine to five or my night, let's call it eight to 2 a.m. <laughs> um, all of those transactions and conversations happen online. And because of that, it's impersonal. You can't see how people feel. You can't get a sense of somebody's expertise or what do they call it? Business acumen, you know, how much business they've conducted, how professional they are, how serious they are. Um, it's hard to do business or, uh, or communicate business and collaborate with people online because you just don't know who they are and what they represent and what their goals and intentions are unless they're very good communicators. Now, I'm talking very out of the box, conceptual, 50,000 feet in the air, zoom out on this issue. Let's talk about common situations that people would go through. So the gripe that uh, OB was talking about is people coming up to him and lowballing him in transactions. And this is what this entire episode is centered around. We're gonna get very narrow now. I think the number one reason why amateurs and professional business people conducting transactions and services and products online, the reason they run into issues is this huge dark cloud of this concept, which I absolutely hate, which is called DM me serious inquiries only, or hit me up, DM me for more info. And this is what happens. A producer may say, beat sale, or yo, I just cooked up these fire beats, DM me, serious inquiries only. And th there's so many flaws and so many uh, pitfalls that await on the other side of this offer because you have not named a price. If you named a price and said, hey, these are the, the, the price of my beats, people would know right away whether or not they can afford them and if it's a close enough price range to be worth bargaining for. But these producers aren't doing that. Artists do the same thing. They'll say, hey, feature sale or hey, I'm working with budgets. That's another popular air quote that people like to use. The working with budgets thing is kind of a middle of the road. It's like the secretive side is DM me serious inquiries only. The other side is here's my price and the I'm working with budgets is kind of in the middle. It's a hybrid. It's, it's trying to say, okay, I don't have a fixed price exactly it can vary and I'm willing to negotiate or I'm willing to see what your circumstances and what you could bring to the table. Now, what I will say is in the music game at the amateur level, everything is negotiable. I don't care if somebody says, hey, my feature price is $200. Everything is negotiable for this one fact. I have yet to meet somebody who has not changed their pricing structure regularly. Meaning whatever they charge for something, the price has always gone up or there's somebody who can say, well, I purchased that product or service or feature or collab for less at this particular time. And it really boils down to this. People rely on these facets for income and art is perceived value. A lot of people might not perceive your art as important and as valuable as you see your art. And so what happens when you go into a market that doesn't perceive your art as valuable as you do? You either have to leave the market and go find a group of fish to swim around who can afford you and who also see you as valuable, or you can stay here and convince them of your value, possibly harder task, or you come down off of your prices or you sacrifice in another area. But see, what a lot of artists do is basically they play in, they kind of act as chameleons where they come off as, well, I'm professional and I make X amount of money. I'm not going to tell you what that is, but it's growing. But there's some months I'm hurting 
and I need to come down off my price, but I don't want to seem as if I'm decreasing in perceived value. So instead I'll shoot out a DM me serious inquiries only because the reality is, is you're not charging person A the same as you're charging person B. And if you disclosed that, then they might feel a type of way. Features are the same situation, and I'm even guilty of this, not in the sense that I haven't disclosed this, but everybody's done this at some point. They will have a feature price, and they will gladly post it. But then the next time they run into somebody else, they find out, oh, they collabed with that person for free. And then an artist might come off and try to be prideful and say, well, I can choose to charge whoever I want, and which is absolutely true. But when you're trying to conduct your services as a public service, you can't be tripping when people call you into question or want to bargain with you. And the reality is, is if people got shut down on their first attempt at a bargain, they might learn really quick that the culture of business in this Christian hip hop space or hip hop space is one where there isn't any bargaining available. But the reality is that everybody bargains and a lot of people are desperate. So they're willing to make you feel like you're less valuable for the sake of nailing that collab or getting that opportunity or having you lower your price or having you do something for the low for free. Because the bottom line is they're broke and if they have the money, they don't wanna spend it on you. They don't, they, they want the value from you without paying you, without bringing something to the table. They want to give you what they want to give you. It's not even what they think you're worth. And here's the most important thing that that's just absolutely hilarious. Before I said, I called it hot dog wallet, but this is what it is. Everybody in Christian hip hop and CHH, the community, whether you're an artist, dancer, whatever, if you charge for a product or service, people have what I call Caviar taste hot dog wall uh, hot dog wallet. Okay, I'm gonna say that again. Caviar taste with a hot dog wallet. They walk around with the brand, with a logo, with a cool outfit, with maybe a music video, with a catalog of music, and they think that because they have some pieces of the puzzle that they're actually professionals. And the reality is like 99% of CHH don't make full-time livable income in the arts. Their music cannot support them. They work jobs. The, the, the music for them is serious and as God honoring in its pursuit as it might be, it is still at best in reality a glorified hobby. It's not, it can't even be classified to be taken seriously, but they walk around and attempt to be professional even though they don't have the credentials. And so we have this giant community of people lacking real credentials, meaning you make a living off of your art. You have a right to conduct business. You know what business looks like. Everything you do is a calculated move. You, you have business acumen. You understand clear communication. You understand bargaining. You understand respect of people's art. You know how to turn somebody down or how to negotiate. You know how to look at a situation and say, you know what, that's out of my range. I need to move somewhere else. You can be adjustable. Um, nobody really ha has those skills. So they kind of just go around participating in the culture with their glorified hobby and they try to be as professional as they know how to be. Now let's go back to the point here. I wish I would have wrote a lot of these down so I could address it in order, but we're going to have to touch base on this depending on if people even want me to elaborate on this, but I believe I have a lot of insight here. Here's the thing, bro. If you're in a situation, and this is most people, where you have a number that you typically try to hit, you know people pay you this amount for, for your beat or for your collab or for your service, and you don't want to duck that number ever, but you find yourself in a situation where you're hurting, I think in general, it is just best practice to put your prices somewhere. If you're willing to come off your price at a certain season, but you don't want to come off of it in its entirety, you can do a sale, you can do a seasonal thing, you can do a one-timer where you post, hey, whatever. But don't, if you don't want to be all out there with your prices and stuff, throw it on a Dropbox PDF. Throw it on your website, a place where people can click 
serious inquiries or buy my beats and they can see some sort of document or some sort of video where you outline your pro your prices and you could put at the bottom subject to change and if they change they change or you could put possibly negotiable or however you want to slice it if you want to be a hard nose and not change your prices set it up however the heck you want but disclose it you, it, you can't have a lemonade stand and offer lemonade but say serious inquiries only, but you don't even have a price listed for the lemonade. But you're upset when somebody comes up to the lemonade stand and says, hey, can I get a drink? And then you say, well, I charge. And then they try to negotiate with you. They're like, well, you're not even, you, you haven't even, when I go to a store, the eggs and the milk have a price tag on them. And even if they, and price tags change. I don't know if y'all been seeing in the grocery store, the prices of goods have gone up. You don't see nobody going around complaining about that because it's professional and it's disclosed and it is the way it is. If you want the product at that time, prices have gone up. Things are in demand and you have to deal with it. You can do the same thing with your business. Disclose information to help the buyer know if they can actually take seriously the transaction and jump in and give you an, an inquiry. What is a serious inquiry if I don't have serious information to make that decision? How can you speak to me so vaguely, but you want a very specific person with a very specific budget? We cannot be afraid to disclose prices and be willing to change and be willing to bargain and negotiate. If you don't, if this doesn't support you full time, then you have to be flexible. You have to be adjustable. And if you don't want to be, then you just simply get out the game and make it art for art's sake. You know, that's another thing is I think people have their foot half in and half out. It's like one day they want to put on the business hat and act all professional like they have prices. The next month they do their next five features for free. Everyone doesn't take them seriously anymore because they're like, well, I know you did all that on the low or whatever. And then when it comes down to, well, that was a better opportunity for me and I negotiated, they ain't trying to hear all that. You know, and that is the reality too is as you're navigating this journey and you are charging for certain situations that you don't, that, 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 you know, it comes down to leverage as well. And that's why I said at the beginning, everything is bargainable. Like art is perceived value. You know, I know that somewhere I can get consulting at $500 an hour if I'm in the right place because I have the credentials to show for it and I can show that I bring that much amount of money per hour in value. But if I go take that to the CHH community and expect to get clientele, I'm an idiot. You know, so you have to know the market that you're in. You have to know your goals and you have to be willing to disclose. I over disclose. Because like, for instance, with my mixing and mastering services, I want a very specific type of client and I understand there's certain things that I can't provide because I'm not there with the artist in the studio. And so I factor that into my price, but also this isn't my nine to five. I don't rely on it. Like I work nine to five hours with that job because I want to service the Christian community with high quality art, but I don't need it at the end of the day. And so the other thing that factors into how I structure my business is I don't have to be sitting there doing it. So I can demand more of the client to comply with a certain level of rules and I can test the market for that and say, okay, I'm in demand so I can be picky. I can pick my schedule. I can work with who I wanna work with. But some of you guys think you have certain leverage when you actually don't. And so it comes to looking in the mirror and saying, okay, as far as your price, how many people are willing to pay that? Oh, okay, if you charge $300 for a feature, but you only do two features a year because no one can afford that or no one thinks you're worth that, if at that point you're just making a, a decision. Doesn't mean it's logical, it's a preference. If you don't need the money, then you can choose to be hard-nosed. And in this, in, the, in this entrepreneurial market, I think a lot of you guys are missing out because you have to have that bargaining mindset because until you actually have serious credentials and you've been doing this for a long time, you can't come out here demanding some type of consistent increase or high number. You also need to know your market. Like what are people just like you with your amount of monthly listeners or followers, what are they making per hour? What are they making per beat? What are they making per collab? If I'm in a realm of a bunch of people charging 200 bucks a feature, what am I doing going in there and charging three, $400 a feature? 
I, I'm, I'm asking to not get clientele. I'm, I'm, I'm blackballing myself. A lot of you guys are blackballing yourself where you don't even understand the market you're in. So you're just letting stuff fly. And that's where collaboration comes in because you need to be talking to other artists. You need to know what people are charging. You need to uh, be willing to compromise so that you can build your portfolio. Because let me tell you something. I haven't marketed my engineering services in like four years straight. I've never put up a sale. I've never posted, hey, does anybody need mixing and mastering? People come to me because at a certain point, my portfolio got so big, the word of mouth got so big, and I never even needed to market myself. The work spoke for itself. And then people come to me and I disclose my prices. And sometimes people come and try to negotiate or take advantage of my rules. And I very hard nose say, hey, this is the way it is. You, you take my services or you don't because I'm in demand. Praise God. And I very humbly say, look, I get to make the rules about how I conduct business. That's why I disclose it so that you can make a quality decision. And I take my work very seriously, but I also take my time and my investment very seriously as well. And I've, conduct, and I've structured the business to where I can provide the maximum amount of quality to the most clients within the limit that I'm willing to accept. And these are the transactional and procedural steps that you have to be willing to take because we are stepping into a business agreement when you purchase a service from me. And that level of procedure is just not there with most people in their business. They, they're just DMing each other and then sending each other a cash app and assuming all of these business traits are going to be there and they don't even know the character of the person that they're working with. So that's why communication is key. Anyway, I'm just venting, guys. Uh, remember your art is perceived value and if people don't perceive it at the value you've set for yourself, then you may want to reconsider what your goals are and whether you're asking too much or little too much or too little, but also are you in the right market? What are your competitors doing? Um, do you have a good perspective based off of research and field study of the level of disclosure you're giving to your, your potential clients, the level of marketing, the level of professionalism, the level of accolades and, and portfolio that you have before you're offering certain levels of service? And are you asking what other people are doing so you have a good sense of what people at your level are doing in your market? Hopefully that was helpful for you guys. If you have any questions, if you disagree with anything, throw it in the comments. I give feedback very quickly because I got nothing better to do. Thank you guys so much. I hope that was helpful for you guys. If you want stuff more specific on like, because that's one thing I left out tonight is how to approach certain situations, like very common scenarios. Like if there's an artist who charges $100 for a feature and you know you can't afford it, what happens when you don't have money? Can you use other forms of leverage like your follower count or your stream count or some work in your actual portfolio to leverage? Or can you leverage... Um, and can you barter? Can you trade a service or a skill in exchange for that item or service that you're looking to do? And how do you see if that's even possible to offer to an artist? And what are the words you'd use to say something like that? Um, and, and what happens when you encounter a rough situation? And how do you be respectful but also inquire um, what do you do in a situation that you might have just stepped in too deep of water and you need to backpedal? There's a ton of different, very specific scenarios that I have specific answers for that I think could be very helpful, but I don't really want to throw it out there um, just kind of frisbee-like. I'd like it to be more interactive. If people want the information, comment below, DM me, and I'd be happy to share the information if I think it's important enough I'll include it on the channel. With that being said, guys, y'all have a wonderful, blessed night. Uh, my new record with Faux Eva is called Paved Away, now out on all digital platforms. It's doing lovely. It's a really dope song. I'm getting in my rap bag. A lot of y'all have been hearing me sing uh, too much. I'm getting back in my rap bag. So this is a collaboration I did with Faux Eva. He was uh, gracious enough to put me on his album. Um, I believe his album called The Hills 2 drops this weekend. So make sure y'all go and check that out. But yeah, check out that collab. I got a lot of new music on the way. I just dropped a single last month as well. I'll be dropping um, a couple records as well. On the horizon for my music, I have two projects in mind. Don't hold me to it, but I've already started making a ton of records for these projects. I have a uh, album idea called God, and Gu uh, God Loves Guitars. 
uh, or God and Guitar or something in that realm. And it's basically an album all guitar themed. It's varying levels of like hip hop, but it's all every beat has a guitar of some kind in it, electric, acoustic, etc. And it's got a country slash rock slash grunge vibe to it. Um, there's some acoustic stuff on it. Um, and then my other project, uh, Life Infinity 2, um, which is like all super high energy banger Christ anthems um, that I am doing now. It's very futuristic sounding. Um, it sounds like a euphoric cartoon hyphy turn up <laughs> that just doesn't come down. Um, so those are two pro uh, album concepts I'm working on. I'm sitting on like 50 or 60 tracks and I'm still carving out some new ones, but I have a lot of music on the way for y'all this year. This will be a special year, but I've talked your ear off enough. Y'all go get some sleep. Tune in next time. Love y'all. Peace.